in the word. Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for everyone who you have brought here. I thank you because no one is here by accident. No one is here by chance. I thank you because all of these people, you have drawn them to yourself today. And so I ask, Lord, that whatever it is that you intended for them to hear, Lord Jesus, that you will take charge of my vocal cords and pass that across to them. Let them hear it, not just in their ears, but in their spirit, in the name of Jesus. Let them live here and let it be seeds that will yield fruit in their life in the name of Jesus. I ask the Lord that the spirit and the life be imparted to them and not just the letters, not just the words in Jesus' name. Father, take control, have your way. I yield myself completely to the authority of the Holy Spirit and I ask that you have your way, even as I teach this day by your grace at work in me. Thank you, Lord, for in Jesus' name uh, I have prayed. Amen. Amen. Okay. Amen. So, um, when I put this message together, I didn't have the title in place, but thanks to now, we have a title. So, the title is going to be centered around faithfulness. Um, I'll go into the message, I'll go into the scriptures, and then we'll kind of understand, you know, how that applies to us, if you will. So I want to open it up with the uh, opening scripture, which is from the book of Mark, um, chapter four. It's a parable that we're all familiar with. Um, at least I, I'm pretty sure most of us are familiar with it. And I'll start reading from verse three. Um, now I'll go through uh, some of the other verses. Um, but I hope that today, you know, God touches us in the way that we need to receive this word. Uh, it's very interesting because when I started putting this message together or basically as the Holy Spirit gave it to me, I was like, why well, does it have to be, you know, along this line, right? And then, you know, the ladies start leading prayers and I realized, okay, it, I guess this is how he wants this, you know, message to go, right? So um, we're going to go there with him today. So I'll start from verse three of Mark chapter four. I'm reading KJV. It says here, it says, um, uh, hearken behold there went out a sword to sow so this is the parable of the sword like i said we all know this parable so i'm just going to be reading it here um it says and it came to pass as he sowed some fell by the wayside and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up and some fell on stony ground where it had not much earth and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of, of earth but when the sun was up it was scorched and because it had no roots it withered away and some fell among thorns and the thorns grew up and choked it and it yielded no fruit. And then verse eight says, and others fell on good ground and did yield fruits that sprang up and increased and brought forth some 30, some 60, some 100. Um, and he said unto them, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. So today my message is really from this portion of scripture and um, before I go into exactly just what I wanted us to pay attention to, I want to point to something. The fact that in this parable, I think most of the time when we listen to this parable, we hear this parable from the perspective of, you know, the ground, right? Us, the people, right? You know, you receive the word and maybe it didn't yield fruits, maybe it yielded fruits, I don't know, whatever the case may be, right? It's, you know, it's like you, you, you find yourself in one of these buckets. In, in one bucket or another, whether you're, you know, in the first category or the second category or the third category, or by the mercies of God, the fourth category, right? But in studying this portion of scripture, it occurred to me that there are actually two parties that have a responsibility here in this parable for the outcome to have been exactly what it needed to be, right? So when you read the story, it's talking about a sore. That's really what it's about. So when they talk about <clears throat> this story, it's talking about the parable of the sword. It's not been talking about the parable of the, the ground or the, or, or the earth. It's, it's talking about the parable of the sword, right? And the Bible says that the sword went out to sow and it came to pass that as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, you know, some fell on stony ground, some fell on, you know, amongst thorns and all of that. At the end of the day, you find that regardless of the quality of the um, ground that the seed fell on, the sower had a responsibility to direct the seed that was being sown. The sower had a responsibility to ensure that the seeds being sown were sown on good ground. 
So having said that, now let me get into uh, the portion of the message that um, I think we want to pay attention to today. So I'm going to move down to verse 15, right? Actually, no, I'll start from 13, right? So this is after Jesus had spoken the parable and now his disciples were asking him questions like, okay, what does this mean? What are you talking about? And so from verse 13, it says here, it says, and he said unto them, know ye not this parable? And how then will you know all parables? So what he's saying is this, this is the basic stuff. This is 101. This is as basic as it will ever get. So I'd like to say that what we're going to share today is essentially foundation, fundamentals. That's what we're looking at today. So it says, if you don't know this parable, how will you even know all parables? That is, I've not even started traveling. Mm? This is just the, this is just the opening and you don't understand this so how do you even hope to get the rest of what i'm trying to tell you so from verse 14 it says the sower soweth the word so he's now breaking it down and helping them understand what's going on here the sower soweth the word and these are they by the wayside where the word is sown but when they have heard satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts so I'll pause there because I want us to take a look at three different categories of, of uh, would I say, soil or, or, or grounds that the seeds fell on that didn't yield fruit. Because my hope is that we can look at this parable, look at the different categories and see where we fall. Now, I'm not sure that we'll cover all three today, but we will do, I think we'll do at least two of them um, or even just one. Right, because I want us to do a deep dive. Like I've always said, my goal when we do these Bible studies is to not just read like we've read before, but to one, be able to hear God in the scriptures and to be able to see ourselves in the scriptures as well. So when we walk away, it has that transformative power over us, right? We really understand what's being said and we understand the part that we play in the whole story. So it says here, it says that the first category is the category of those where the word, you know, comes to them and, you know, it falls by the wayside. And so before they even figure out what they're doing with themselves, Satan comes and takes it away immediately. And by the grace of God, I know that that's not even the condition of, you know, any of us on this uh, platform, because the mere fact that you're even here on this Saturday afternoon shows that like you have regard for the things of God and you're actually interested in getting to know him. So I'd like to think that the people being described in this portion are people who are still navigating their way to God, people who are still not very sure of, you know, who God is and things like that, you know, perhaps unbelievers, right? People who don't yet understand, you know, the things of the kingdom, right? And so they're at that point where, you know, the word can still come and be stolen away from their hearts. And so as a result of that, you find that work must be done to ensure that whether a person started as being by the wayside, they somehow gravitate to where their hearts become soil that can receive the seed. Because this is the reason why for majority of people, you know, sometimes we we are praying for people, we are interceding for them, we are, you know, maybe even speaking the word of God to them, but it feels like they are not hearing us. They are not, you know, listening to us. And this is the Bible. This is what the Bible is helping us understand. That for some people, they are in a state where it's not that they want to oppose or anything. It's just when the word comes, they are still so porous that the enemy is able to come and steal the word from them. So it does nothing for them. So they hear it and it's like how we describe, you know, things in uh, Nigeria. What we say, it came in through one ear and came out through the other ear. That's, you know, really how it is, right? So we're not even looking at that right now because like I said, I don't think that that's the state of anybody here because the mere fact that you're here shows that you actually care to find out what God has to say to you. So I want us to take a look at the second um, and the third. And I think for the purpose of today, we might only be able to cover the second because, yeah, let's just go into the second. So I think that's um, from verse 17 right so it's talking actually we're going to start from verse 16. it says and like and these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground so this is the second category the people that you know it was captured about them in the beginning where it says the seeds fell on stony ground right and it says but when they have heard the word immediately receive it with gladness and have no root in themselves and so they endure for a time 
afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. So I'm going to pause here for a little bit because I think that many of us can really relate to this and we may not have wanted to, but as we go into it, you might find that this indeed describes sort of what your experience um, in Christianity maybe was at some point or maybe still is, right? And maybe that's the reason why you're seeking stuff outside of your typical routine um, to really troubleshoot where you are. So in looking at the people who the Bible categorizes as those who the word fell on stony ground, it's talking about people who, first of all, it says that they have no root. Okay. It's talking about people who the word falls on them, but there's just nowhere for it to go. And I want to bring it down to our experience, right? Like humans, we're going to stop talking about seed and, and, and stone for a bit, just so we can understand. Because up until some years ago, when, you know, for us, at least my husband and I, it became crucial for us to find this God and know for a fact that he is actually real. I mean, not that we didn't think he was real, but I'm sure you understand what I'm saying. You get to a point where you're like, something isn't quite adding up and I need to find more. I need to find out what this work it really is about. For many people, before you get to that point, you would have been in that space, in that state where, you know, the Bible is describing as, you know, being the stony ground. Because for many years, a lot of us, you know, just got accustomed to church. We got accustomed to activity. We got accustomed to just doing stuff. So we go to church on Sundays, we hear the word, we come home and that's it. You know, if they ask people to indicate what, who they are, we'd indicate that we're Christians, right? If people are talking about the things of God, if we're talking about, you know, God's love and God's grace, right? Then we're there, you know, we can relate. It sounds good. We, we are willing to receive that. But the Bible says, and this is what's very interesting, because it means that it is very possible to be in this state for a long time and not realize that that's where you are. And the Bible records, it says, and so they endure, but for a time, but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. And so the question is, how are they possibly offended? It's the word. You're a Christian. You said you love God. So how are you possibly offended? But the problem goes back to the beginning. Like I said, this parable is talking about two people, the person sowing as well as the person receiving the word. So I'll just spend a couple of minutes on the sower part because it's so, so crucial. Because many of us have at one point in our walk with God found ourselves in churches that had for some reason kind of evolved into being a social gathering centered around religious topics, which is not what the church was intended. That's not what Jesus said the church would be called. That's not what God said, you know, what Jesus said, um, the house of God would be called. And I want to, you know, just paint that picture so that we can, in quote, diagnose ourselves and see where we are. If this in any way relates to where we are in God. So I remember when um, King Zara was going to start and uh, I was talking to someone locally, actually, um, and they were saying how, you know, they just really wanted to find a fellowship and, you know, they wanted to find, you know, a place that they could go. Like this was out of the pandemic, right? And like people had been at home for a long time. And, you know, the person was talking about wanting to find a church and, you know, somewhere where they could worship and all of that. And, and you know, I, you know, I'm happy to hear that, right? So I'm like, yeah, I'm like, awesome, right? Like, you know, if you want, you know, there are small groups that can happen, blah, blah, blah. So I don't know why I asked. I said, so, you know, what are you looking at? Like, what are you looking to, like, what's your goal, right? Like, what are you looking for? And the person may, you know, give a description. And, you know, we cannot even judge because I'm sure we've all been at this point as some part of our walk or another. And she said, oh, she's just looking for a church where she can meet people where she can network, right? Like people with like similar backgrounds, people who she can relate with and things like that, right? And I remember thinking like, you're really going to go through this trouble to find a church just so you can meet people, you know? 
but I, I know that, you know, that's where, that's based on where I was at the time, right? Because we had done all of that, right? We had met people, we had networked, all of that, you know? But this was the genuine heart posture of this Christian. I want to meet people. I want to network. I don't have friends in the city. So I'm looking for people. And this is exactly the description of, you know, just what the Bible is trying to point out to us when it says these category of people, people who have no roots, people who have no roots. And so when things happen, like Shadi was saying, things happen eventually because that's life, right? And so when these things happen, they end up being the first to fall away. Why? Because they had no roots. So the Bible describes that situation very clearly. It says that when the sun comes out, it scorches and burns these kinds of people off. And I'm saying that not pointing at anybody because, I mean, except maybe you grew up like children of ministers and things like that. That was not my experience, right? Because I know that there was a time in my life also where I was also looking at church in that way, like, okay, what can I get there? And there's still many Christians. There's still many of us who are looking for that. Like, like Shade was talking about, like, we're not looking for the ancient paths. We're looking for the pockets of comfort that we can find in church. We're looking for environments that can cuddle some, some parts of our flesh, right? Some parts of our flesh that we're not yet willing to part with. So these are people who, when they go to a church or when they try to find a church, they are trying to find a church that they can find young people that are their age, age mates, that they can meet. Funny story, I remember when I just moved to the US, right? I moved to a small town and, you know, being Nigerian, all I just ever thought that I would, you know, uh, would I say, as far as like getting married or whatever, like my whole mind was, okay, I'm obviously going to marry a Nigerian, right? Like that was my mindset at the time. Um, and so I moved to a small town and I joined a church there, obviously a Nigerian church, right? And I remember like at, at some point in time, I kid you not, like this is a thought that was crossing my mind because I was thinking, well, this is a small town where very few Nigerians here. So it's probably maybe two Nigerian churches here. And I realized that like, you know, a lot of the churches there, not even a lot of the churches, the Nigerian churches and the Nigerian community in those churches, they were full of like young people, but most of them were either married or engaged or it was clear that these two are together. So I remember a part of me like thinking like, do I need to go to another church? I'm not even lying. Like, so that's why I said when I'm, when I'm saying this, I'm not saying it to people like, oh, this is how you are. I'm saying like, as Christians, we've likely passed through these different parts of our walk with God. And the reason that, you know, I, I, I find it important for us to open these things up and address them for what they are is because this is a time where God is calling us back to the ancient paths. He's calling us back to the paths of holiness, the paths of righteousness, the paths where you are very clear where you stand and why you stand there. And so at that time I was thinking, do I need to go and join some of these other American churches or something? Because this one that is a handful of Nigerians in the church and every one of them is already either married to someone or engaged or something. But you see, that's really what the Bible is referring to when it says people, you know, who are supposedly in the fold, but they have no roots. And this is also part of the responsibility of the sower. Because at the end of the day, you know, part of what the church is, need to be teaching us which for many years that messaging has kind of dulled out part of the messaging that you know we needed to be receiving from church from the you know shepherds and pastors of us were messages that will help us migrate from being stony ground to being people who could take root because you find that the description of the people who couldn't stay, the description of the people who things will sweep away, the people who um, life will happen to them and then they fall away are people who don't have roots. And I'm saying this because, like I said, as Christians, this is very important because you will likely end up in a part of your walk with God where because you lacked the root, because you lacked the standing, it then becomes hard for you to stand. It becomes hard for you to yield to God. It becomes hard for you to take that stand boldly and just, even if you find yourself standing alone, still stand there. And this is happening a lot today. And we're actually dealing with that. That is why we find that in the body of Christ now, it is very rampant. It's very common that there are people who will say, oh, they are Christians, but still they indulge in this or still they engage in that. 
because the 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 journey or the the path to taking roots it's actually a bit uncomfortable and that's likely why for many of the churches because it's uncomfortable for people and people would leave so then you know i i, I feel that you know so men of god felt the pressure to skew their messages to such a place where it's like okay you can still accept it without feeling offended because that part of the scripture ends with saying they got offended that spirit of offense is a very very real spirit that is very prevalent in the church you find many people who will say oh i don't do church anymore i don't go to church anymore and when you ask why you trace it to one offense or another so all of this is going on the lack of roots the fact that the sun came and scorched but the end point is that the spirit of offense takes root in people's hearts it means that no matter how much of church going that you are doing no matter how active you are in your church if the word of god has not really taken root in your heart, you are still susceptible to that spirit of offense that has the ability to tear you away from god yes it does because it starts with people saying oh because xyz happened in their church and they decided to leave or maybe they grew up you know with um you know in church homes like you know maybe their parents were ministers and maybe they saw their parents behaving in a certain way then they got offended and they said well i don't want to go to church anymore i'm going to see god on my own and it almost always is a lie because what it is is that eventually the enemy is able to pull you into a place of isolation where he's then able to introduce as many you know tactics of deception as possible into your life so then you find a situation where you are not quite hot not quite cold you don't know where to stand when things like you know of, of like deep matters of real hard work come up you find that that spirit of offense shoots up and then you pull away again it's one spirit that as a christian you, you must always guard yourself against and that's why when people say oh this thing happened or that thing happened to them maybe in the church or by another Christian, my advice is leave, just go. Like, I don't have anything else to tell you. Go. Because if this thing has the potential to sow or open your, you up for the spirit of offense to take root, then you are nearly on your way out of the fold, not just that particular church, of the fold. Because what it does is it, it, it ends up leaving this wound, this scar in you that you just, you, you now end up carrying around. So my, my hope is that we can, like I said, assess where we are and how we have approached church. And I honestly sense that for many of us, it's because you've gotten to that point where you're beginning to question what's going on in your regular Sunday routine that you're likely here. Because a lot of us got very comfortable with activities going on in church and even the ministers, it's actually worked for them to be comfortable. I want to point something out here because like I said, when the ladies were praying today, I was just like, thank you, Holy Spirit, right? The Bible says here in verse 16, it says, And these are they likewise, which are sown on stony ground, who, when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness. It's very interesting. They receive it with gladness. Now, I'm not saying that the word of God is not supposed to be received with joy or anything. But you know, the thing is this, right? Sometimes the fact that people are receiving the word of God with gladness, it's not an indication of that, oh, their heart is open and, you know, they are so excited about the word it's usually an indication of the amount of dilution that has happened to the word that they are receiving so when you come to god and when you go to certain churches and the message is really about how god is about to do a new thing god is about to do a miracle god is about to open doors and things like that of course your heart is going to be glad right so you receive the word with gladness that's what the bible is describing here these are they which immediately so you don't have to do any work. This is what is concerning. Because if something is stony ground and seed must take root in it, it must be broken off. And if stones could feel, I bet the feeling of breaking stone, breaking it open so that you can get to earth underneath and, and plant seed there, it's not a comfortable one. So when the Bible is saying something is stony ground, seed is being planted in it and it is being received immediately with gladness, then you know that we have to look at that thing just a little more closely. Because let me point something to you in Matthew chapter 19. Um, I found this very interesting. This was Jesus, right? Um, you know, being asked like, well, how can I get to heaven? You know, um, where's it, where's it said? Okay, good. The rich young man. 
right? So I want to paint a picture of somebody who is receiving the word. Okay. So it says, you know, he came to Jesus and asked, he said, good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, you know, why callest me thou, why callest thou me good? You know, there is none good but me, all of that. And, you know, he said, well, go do all the commandments, right? You're wanting to know. So, okay, don't steal, don't do this, don't do that. That's it. And the young man said unto him, he said, all these things I've kept from my youth, you know, up. What like I yet? Do you understand that what this man is trying to do is he's trying to move, he's trying to migrate because he understands that something is still missing. Something is still missing. So for many people, if the mercy of God is able to locate you when you are in this whole setting of the activity of church, in this setting of complacency, in this setting of we come there and we love the dance, the dance group we come there because we love the worship team we like how this particular minister hits that note right when they start singing if we're still in that state and the mercy of god locates us we begin to ask questions like this man what lack i yet nobody came to bother this man in this house but he himself realized that something was lacking this thing that i'm doing it's not looking like i'm actually quite getting you know to the to the heart of the matter and it was when Jesus realized that, oh, okay, you really are looking for the deep stuff. I can get that for you. And so he tells him, he says, if thou will be perfect, go and sell that thou hast and give to the poor and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. Verse 22. It says, but when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. I hope you're understanding what I'm trying to compare now right because we're looking at a situation you know in in uh the book of mark where it's saying you know these people receive the word immediately they receive it with gladness like yay you know it's a carnival in in the church right it's a party every sunday after sunday my church you know serves snacks and stuff there's networking time i get to meet good business people and things like that right so maybe that's the description of your current experience in your walk with god but the question is do you really have root because it's when, you know, the hard matters show up that, you know, people will start to know, did I really have roots or not? It says it, they will endure for a time. Yes. It'll look like you're doing it right. It'll look like you're, you know, yes, this is all looking great. But after a time, you'll find that you didn't really take roots. So you'll find that you're like that rich young man who came to Jesus and said, you know what? I know this is what you're telling everybody, but I know something else is missing. So tell, give me the real thing. Because what I have right now, I don't think is the complete stuff. And Jesus then told him, you know what? Now that you're serious, this is it. So the question is, have we come to that place of seriousness where we're done with the carnivals, where we're done with the with the celebrations, where we're done with the networking sessions, where we're done with the um, you know, snacks, where we're done with all of that, where we're done with the, you know, fancy sayings on the pulpit to where we're wanting to ask Jesus, something is missing. I need to get my life right with you. And I know that something is missing. So what is it, master? Have we come to that point yet? Are we at that point yet? Because if we're not, the Bible describes, you know, such a person that says when affliction or even persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. Like the prayer leaders uh, mentioned, there is an attribute of your walk with God that if it's not in place, you can't say with 100% confidence that you will always find yourself where God is. Faithfulness. That faithfulness. Like, have you gotten to the heart of God where you have decided that, you know what, I'm in this, in this. I'm with God because of God. Or are we still doing this whole thing because like I said, the message sounds good. It makes us feel comfortable. I was describing something to someone the other day. I said, the, the, the thing that bothers me is that a lot of the churches now and the way that the services have been structured, it feels like one big group therapy session. And don't get me wrong, therapy is good for the soul. But the question is, is the spirit truly being fed? Can we say that what is being served is actually feeding our spirit? helping us grow, breaking that hard ground, that hard, hard surface of our hearts, getting the stone out of the way so that the seed can really take root. Now, it's a responsibility of the sower, but the reality is this, if the sower will not do the work, because the, the sower is a farmer, 
And I don't know any farmer who does not realize that part of his job is to actually make the ground ready to receive seed. So on the one hand, the responsibility is on the farmer, right? To prepare the ground, to be able to receive that seed. So it's his job to break up the stone, to remove the debris, to prep the earth, put the fertilizer, whatever it takes, so that when the seed goes in, it can take root. But unfortunately, it's not happening everywhere. But the thing is this, if you have to wait for the sower, if you have to wait for the farmer to prep you, you may be waiting a long time in some of the establishments that we have currently. Now, I don't say this because I have any problem with churches or because I have any problem with any men of God or whatever. I really think that a lot of, you know, the ministers are doing the absolute best that they can, given the circumstances and situations that they have surrounding them. But my concern is for you, the one receiving the seed. You have a responsibility to yourself to see that these things are actually taking root in you. Because if they are not, a day will come where it will be hard for you to stand because of it. You will find that, you know, you, you are easily offended. And that's why, you know, the other day, Shelly and I were having a discussion, right? I think it was a discussion. Oh, yeah, I think so. Because I'd shared some things online. It was a burden on my heart. I said the way that some people are being led to Christ, some people are being introduced to God, it's almost like we're marketing Jesus as somebody who's giving out goodie bags as someone who's giving people nice stuff. So we want to tell people to come to God, but we can't be sincere enough to tell them who Jesus really is and why we come to Jesus. And so we're selling it with, oh, you know what, Shade? Just please finish us. Shade said it's party pack religion. It really feels that way. So we, we are evangelizing and we're telling people about Christ. But we're telling people about Christ as somebody who's who's doing giveaways. And the problem is that it's an indication of how much root the word even has in our own hearts. Because if our best line, if our best way of inviting people to come know Jesus is that Jesus gave me a big house and Jesus gave me a uh, uh, one million dollar business in a year right my, my business made one million dollars because i started following christ if that is the religion that we're selling to people if that is the christ that we're selling to people then we're in for a big shock and we're in for trouble because it's an indication that we ourselves we lack roots and also an indication that the people that we are now bringing in based on that have a very long journey ahead of them because they've not yet found christ they just have not that's the truth they found something, they found comfort, they found therapy. They have not found Jesus. So you find that many people are willing to do that because if you can do therapy and keep your soul happy, keep your soul active, keep your soul, you know, just in a comfortable place, then it makes it such that you don't have to do the hard work of bringing your spirit into alignment with God. So you come there and you hear a few words and they'll take you for the next six days. And so you can come back on the seventh day for a new dose. Why? Because you're not getting down. You're not getting in there. So it's quickly sprouting out fruits. We're willing to go out and tell people, oh, Jesus changed my life. I found Jesus. You people need to find Jesus. But the question is, what have you found about Jesus? Have you gotten to that point of the rich young man who is telling, who is coming to Jesus to say, you know what? I found something, but I feel that I'm still missing something. So we're wanting people to come to God because we are selling him as somebody who's giving stuff. But the thing is, everybody's journey is gonna be different in God. And so that's the reason why some of us are struggling today because that's honestly the way we came to God. That's why we are still here confessing, but we're still, we're so frustrated. We are, we are, we are literally one, one toe remaining to go and join the people practicing new age because the God that was marketed to us when we gave our lives to Christ, it's not quite aligning with what our journey is looking like. It's not quite aligning with what our experiences are looking like. A few Saturdays ago, we uh, had a message where we're talking about like, you know, yielding to God, Jesus as your savior. And we're talking about coming to that point of decision, knowing that Jesus is enough for you. And I was given an example <laughs> of, you know, Christians, who are going to spend 21 days in January fasting and praying only to, in February, hustle to buy Beyonce's tickets. 
right? And I gave that example and we were laughing. But the honest truth is this is as real as it gets. Because lo and behold, and I had no idea, right? But lo and behold, you know, I get offline and then I see that a whole thing had happened on social media because the minister of God dared to say the truth. That as Christians who truly profess Christ as Lord and Savior, you have no business at Beyonce's concert. Because we cannot mince words about the fact that it's not a music concert. It is a worship concert for another goddess, right? So she dared to say the truth. And the sad part was that I think believers, unbelievers may have just walked past it. But Christians were the ones who were willing to drag her, willing to fight, willing to argue, willing to oppose her, willing to complain about someone literally saying the truth of God's word. And I just feel such a holy anger rising within me as I say this, because that explains to you how poor of a job has been done on the foundations of many of us. How much many of us lack the root that it takes to actually sprout fruit. So we are literally still staying in that category of the stony ground that just one small sun can come out and burn us away like we never existed. Because why would it be that somebody will hear this word? I love that the Bible is very explicit about this stuff. It says, when persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. This is honestly, to me, this is literally a description of what happened on social media as a result of that, that, uh, that video. Simply because somebody was bold enough to tell you, you are not going to listen to music, you are not going to be entertained, you are going to get into partnership with a spirit that is not of God. You are going to worship another God. We can be very interesting as Christians. But yes, or we say it's not that deep. Well, it's your root that is not that deep. Because if the root was that deep, right, you would know that it is in fact that deep. So this is what I'm trying to, you know, spend some time on for us to be able to assess. When things come at us that cause us to be faced with the word of God straight on, no dilution, no, you know, no, no padding, no sugar coating. Are we able to receive it or does it arouse offense in us? It really helps you understand where you are. And there is no pride in, in you know, in, in insisting, oh, I, you know, it's, it's, it's just me and God. At the end of the day, yes, it's me and God. But I, I said it, you know, I, I was very clear about what our mission is in King's Arrow. We are women arising in righteousness and power. They go together. They go together. Okay, so that's why, you know, the messages end up being along this line. Because like I said, why would something like that offend you? It's an indication of a root problem. It's an indication of a root problem. And it's like I said, the churches have not prepped people to really understand that this is what they're up against. So can you then blame them when their own pastor has bought their own tickets? You understand what I'm saying? And is excitedly, you know, talking about it. Can one then blame them? So like I said, this whole thing it's really addressing both the sower and the ground because as sowers some you know uh, uh of, of of the of the sowers have not done a good job of helping you know the ground be able to take seed and so that's why we see this problem that spirit of offense is the one spirit that will be able to quickly tear you away from god if like i i, I want to say it so that you hear it and you hear it well if the response you have when somebody says something is not in alignment with God or when someone calls something demonic or or just terrible out for what it is and your immediate posture is defensiveness or feeling offended, then you have to really check. It is a very dire situation where we're in this place where we cannot tell that we're literally one toe out of following God. We're literally one toe away. Like our whole body is gone, it's just that one toe that's left. So we must be always able to come back to the word of God to check ourselves. As the Bible says, you know, they that compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. Because each human being is also being worked by on by God. But if we get to the point where we are comparing ourselves with scripture, we will be able to find ourselves on the path of wisdom. We'll be able to find ourselves walking, you know, in the way of wisdom. 
we again like i said we can be very interesting and god is honestly just so merciful because can you imagine a scenario where someone is fasting and praying 21 days in january asking god for breakthrough asking god for miracle money asking god to release divine finances for them only for them to take that same money to go purchase a ticket for a worship concert for a different god it, like it's really what it is and we we are in that era like like um Shade said where we need people who will show us the old paths the ancient past because this is how god always dealt with the children of israel st straight truth truth nothing diluted to always be able to check where am i this is the word today and that's why I, like when i express my joy when the prayer leaders lead like i mean it i'm not just saying it to to you know because while i appreciate them i you know i actually truly mean it <clears throat> and that's why i said you know i could go home because they've already preached the message but i will just do my beat we must get tired of just hanging around things that sound good, hanging around the message without actually coming to know Christ. Because things will happen that will then cause people to start um, shifting ground. And so if you have not taken root, you will find that you are in this category of people that the sun comes like this and you're cleared. You're cleared. And that's not how these people intend to go. That's not how they intended for their work to be. But the problem is they never took root. So as Christians, we must all come to that point, like the rich young ruler, where we are able to come to God and say, God, I need you to really get me aligned. I need you to really get my priorities right. I want you to really show me what it means to follow you, what it means to listen to you, what it means to be yielded to you. It's not an easy walk. I mentioned that before, breaking stone is hard work, but we must be willing to do this for ourselves. And if we cannot find that, you know, the people that we're submitted to as spiritual leaders can do this for us, we, then we must migrate very fast. Because there's no calendar in place. There's no timeline in place that says, oh, in six months, you might, you know, uh, you know, encounter something that makes you question your faith, question your work with God. Because I tell you the truth, you know, like I said, Many times, people experience things where they realize that they were never actually as planted as they thought that they were. So we're like these people who, like I said, they receive it, they endure for a while. You lead this in your church, you show up for every service that there is. But that true root, being able to say, I know God, is not there. So we're going to take the, the last category next week, but I needed to spend time here because this is, you know, where the Holy Spirit wanted me to go. Now, I will wrap it up quickly, and I want us to just take a look at John chapter 6, because this explains very clearly, you'll see it literally step by step, the progression of the believer and how people start getting eliminated, how people start falling away. Then you'll see what I'm talking about. Now, I'm not going to read it because I'm telling you that the whole thing goes all the way through till the end, and there's like 71 verses in here. So we're not going to read it through. If you can take the time, please go read John chapter six and ask the, whole, ask the Holy, Holy Spirit to open it up for you because you will see exactly what I'm trying to describe here. Now, um, it starts out with Jesus performing the miracle of feeding 5,000, right? So he had been preaching to the multitude. Um, you know, he had performed miracles and all of that. And in order to disperse them, he noticed that they were hungry and said, you know what, we need to feed them. So he talks to his disciples, they go find food, you know, he blesses it, it's, you know, it's, it increases, he feeds 5,000 with, I think it was five loaf and two fish. Yeah. And he feeds the 5,000 and they're all amazed, right? Because it's like, wow. And they even have fragments. They had baskets that they took up with them. I want us to please listen to this and understand that this, I'm painting a picture of what many times it looks like. I gave an example in the beginning of, well, not in the beginning, somewhere in the middle of when we invite people to Christ as though he's doing giveaways. This is the point where many people find Christ, right? Where they meet him distributing food, free food. Where they meet him distributing bread and fish to, to 5,000 people. This is the point where many people come to Christ and that is the point where they invite other people, right? Like, oh my goodness, this person is giving out free food, come. You know, my business 10X this year. You have to come to Jesus because 
I decided to, you know, uh, pray to Jesus and um, I, I, my business made $1 million this year. Like this is where a lot of people come in from. Okay. Now, if we follow the progression of the story, we'll see where it really gets very serious. So Jesus has done the miracle. And in fact, they wanted to make him a king, but he ran away and everything. Now from verse 16, just please pay attention here. It says, and when the evening was now come, his disciples went down onto the sea and entered into a sheep and went over the sea towards Capernaum. And it was now dark and Jesus was not come to them. And the sea arose by reason of a great wind that blew. So when they had rowed about five and 20 or 30 furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing nigh onto the sheep and they were afraid but he said unto them it is i do not be afraid and so they received him now verse 22 the following day when the people which stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other boat there save the one where into his disciples were entered and that jesus did not go into the boat with his disciples but that his disciples went away and were gone away alone even though many other boats came you know like uh overnight and they just docked there are you understanding what I'm saying here? It's saying that these people saw that Jesus left after his disciples and his disciples took the last boat. So it's clear that the means by which Jesus got there is still is questionable because they knew for a fact that there was only one boat. His disciples took it, but he didn't go with them as somehow he's not there anymore. And so when the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they took shipping. So it meant that you couldn't even say, let me just walk there quickly. They took shipping and came to Capernaum seeking for Jesus. Right? That's what it seems like. Remember that these are the people who were part of the 5,000 who ate free food. Okay? So they are seeking for Jesus. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? When people don't want to be serious with God, it's very clear. And that's why the Bible explained the background of this, that they saw very well that Jesus got there after his disciples and there was no other boat. So why will you know all of that and you find him on the other side? And instead of your question to be, how did you come here, master? If peradventure he will open himself to you and tell you how he came there, you're asking him, when did you come? like you don't know that already so when we're not wanting to be serious when we're not wanting to be sincere when we're not wanting to really dig into the heart of god it's clear it's seen in the language of our prayer it's seen in the things that excite us it's seen in how you know we find ourselves jumping up and down by the different uh, exciting words we hear but not necessarily when we're being called to order so these people saw what they knew what happened that's why the Bible took time to explain that the people who stood on the other side, they knew that there was no other way Jesus could have gotten to the other side. But instead of them to ask them the, ask him the key question that will draw them in and cause Jesus to open himself to them, they're asking him, when did you come? And Jesus knew them. He was always ready for them. And so he answered, he says, verily I say unto you, you seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you ate the loaves of bread and you were filled. And it's the honest truth of what I described earlier so many of us this is why this is why we're still here because you know we're told jesus will open doors oh jesus just gave me five million last week so he's going to give you 10 million like that's it so that's what jesus fed them straight on he didn't even like try to you know help them hide in their deception he said you didn't come because of miracles you came because you ate bread that's why you're here so when I'm saying that, like for many people, this is why they say they receive the word immediately with gladness. That's why. Why won't you be glad if, you know, you come there and immediately it's just it's food they give you. I remember my one of my the first churches I attended when I came to the U.S. And, um, you know, the whole place was just done very beautifully. Like it was, you know, the bathroom was like a spa, you know, you get into the church. It's just like everybody's like you know <laughs> and um for me coming from nigeria it's like okay you know because that's not what i'm used to and then i remember that i had even had a case study during my master's program about how intentionality is put into you know setting up the church so that it's this like very nice like you know carnival like just happy you know looking place so that you come and you stay 
And so this is what the Bible is describing is the people who come because of the food. So you come there, you see that there's a nice Starbucks, you know, corner in front and you're like, I love this because I can get my coffee here. But is the master coffee? Is Jesus's death about coffee? Is the message of salvation about coffee? It's not. You know, it's like, oh, the bathroom is like a nice spot. Oh, I love how they greet you. They have a nice little song and dance they do when you come and you're a new member. But is that what this is really about? And we must address this because we must find our way back to the old path. Because if not, many of us will find that the path we're walking is actually the wide road that leads nowhere. So we must begin to investigate the path that I'm on. Is this the narrow road? Or have I mistakenly found myself on the wide path? So he's telling them, you didn't come here because of the miracles. You came here because I gave you food to eat. And then he goes on to start talking to them about the hard stuff. You know, he's telling them about how <clears throat> he's come from God and how he's the bread of life. He's telling them, I'm the bread of life. And if you eat me, Jesus was very intentional. He could have phrased this thing any other way, but he deliberately did not. He said, you will have to eat me if you are serious. And obviously they couldn't take that. So I don't want to read the whole thing because it's a lot. You know, he was telling them about how, oh yes, you know, God did send manna from heaven, but I right now, I'm the manna that you're, you know, looking for. I'm the food, I'm the one that is sent from heaven. I'm the bread that's sent from heaven for you to eat. And Jesus is telling them, I am the one you must eat. I'm the bread of life. So that bread that I gave you people that you ate that we packed baskets, that's nice. But you must come to me for me. You must be wanting to eat me as the bread, not the loaves that I prayed over and gave you people to eat. Your coming to Christ must be rooted in something deeper than what he's going to do. Whether he's going to perform a miracle, you must find your way to Christ and find a way to be rooted in him because of him, not because of things, right? And so in verse 41, you know, they start murmuring. They start murmuring because it's like, what, what is he talking about? I'm the bread which came down from heaven. What do you mean by your a bread that came down from heaven? First of all, you think that food that came from heaven is manna. Also, we know you. Is your father not this person? Is your mother not this person? Like I said, these are people who, they are, they are their minds were already in a, a place where the stony ground. They just were not willing to receive anything hard. They couldn't take something real. They couldn't be able to take root. So they're still arguing within themselves and Jesus will not back down. He will not let them be. He says, and instead of him to bring it down so that they can receive it in the you know carnival mode that they are used to and the giveaway mode of Jesus that they are used to, he says to them in verse 53, he says, verily, verily, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the son of god and drink his blood you have no life in you whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life and i will raise him in the last day it says for my flesh is meat indeed and my blood is drink is drink indeed now before we start to judge those people i will have us know that many of us have been that kind of christian where because we found ourselves in a church where the preacher was not saying things the way that we like, we decided we were going to leave. And I, my sister and I were talking about it and we we're saying, man, thank God for, you know, delivering us and opening our eyes. Because how many churches did we hop from one to another simply because we're like, I don't like that pastor's tone. Oh, I don't like how he said, I don't like, you don't care about what he said. We're just like, oh, even if it's the truth, the way he said it was mean. And that was what a lot of people kept giving us their defense for pushing back on what the, uh, you know, the the, the uh, woman of God was talking about when she was talking about not going to Beyonce's concert. Oh, it's the way it was delivered. Why does it matter the way it was delivered if the truth is the truth? And this is what Jesus was doing here. He could have brought it down. He could have made it acceptable, but he did not. He said, you will eat my flesh and you will drink my blood. That was hard to receive. So before we even judge these people, we have to know that if we were there back in the day, we may have reacted the same way like, okay, this is wild. This is a lot. Because if you move down to verse 60, it says many therefore of his disciples, when they heard this said, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? And this is what I want to just let you people know. Many times, like I was, you know, sharing from Mark 4, the reason that people are receiving it and coming with gladness, immediately receiving it with gladness is because we haven't come to that hard part. We haven't come to the core of what really this walk is, of what coming to Jesus means. Somebody that says, take my yoke upon you. Like, it's very clear. He's making it very clear. But many times, that's not how we invite people. Obviously, we're not going to tell them, come take a yoke. We're going to say, God loves you. God is giving out, you know, stuff. He's giving money. Come to God. 
so his disciples are saying this is a hard saying who can hear it and so when jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it he said unto them does this offend you i just love how the scripture is all interconnected does this offend you not what somebody else is saying my word does it offend you the truth does it offend you me that i am the truth do i offend you is what he's saying does this offend you remember what we were talking about in mark 4 that the end of that person who's still in that state where they are the stony ground is offense and so that's what he's asking them here i've said these things and i have not minced words i've said it exactly how it is so you can receive it does this offend you so we must always sit and ask ourselves before we get ready to react or be defensive when we hear something that maybe doesn't quite sit right with us or maybe doesn't quite fit into the mold of the cushy you know message of christ that we've received before does this offend if so why uh, from verse uh, 32 it said if this thing offend you said what and if you shall see the son of man ascend up where he was before it's like if what i'm saying alone is offending you if i now if you now see me where i'm ascending up to heaven what will you now do you know i i hope that this word is reaching you know people the way that it needs to because this honestly is something we have to be doing for ourselves troubleshooting where we are with christ because there are some people who today will say oh you know what um I don't know about these churches where, you know, oh, people fall under the anointing. Like, why should people fall? The Holy Spirit is gentle. There's that, like, that's what Jesus asked me. Does this offend you? The truth of who I am, me in my entirety, do I offend you? Or are you only wanting the parts of me that are comfortable, easy to relate to, easy to accept, easy to work with on a day to day? Or are you willing to receive all of me? The part that will rebuke you, the part that will come down forcefully in a meeting and can cause the whole, you know, hall to be on the ground. That can cause people to burst into spontaneous tongues. Are you willing to receive that version of me? Or do you just want the portion of me that fits into your nice, you know, spa built churches and systems that you do every Sunday? Are you willing to receive that or does it offend you? And we must ask ourselves this. Because until we can properly answer that question, we may not truly be able to say, okay, we've come into the reality of who God really is. And so he said things to them. He kept saying things to them. And here's where I want to end my message today. Verse 66. It says, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. That's exactly what we're describing. When the word becomes too hard to receive, when Jesus becomes too much for you to, to, to handle, it says many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. When it starts pointing out areas where you are, you know, uh, in error, when it starts pointing out areas where you are being too lax, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the 12, will you also go away? I love Jesus. He didn't care. He didn't mind. All of you go and that's why like i keep saying i said i don't care what like obviously you know if it's a big group that's great but my hope is that even if we're a handful that we truly can get to a point where we're firmly rooted in christ that no matter where in the world we find ourselves we can boldly and alone stand firm for god regardless of what the voice of the public is regardless of what the voice of the majority is that we can stand stand for God, regardless of what the voice of the public is. He says, will you also go away? He didn't care that thousands of these people left. See the progression. They came to him for bread. That's why I said, if you're coming to Christ, is based on giveaways. If it's based on God gives free houses and he, he grows people's businesses to $1 million, you're not gonna stand. So you must ask yourself, if you really intend to be with the real Jesus and start asking him to help you find him, because while the nice things that he gives are great, we don't come to Christ because of things. We come to Christ because he's Christ. We come to him for him. He has to be enough for us or we cannot stand it. Verse 68, it says, Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. That's what it boils down to. 
if we even go as far as 16, I said, and we believe and are sure that thou art Christ, the son of the living God, period. That's what the whole thing is about. I'll read our response again. He says, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and we are sure that thou art that Christ, the son of the living God. This has to be it for you. If this is not yet it for you, then let this message be one that you take with you and begin to pray. Am I really willing to stand against the public opinion? Am I really willing to pull away from what has kept me comfortable and look for Christ? Christ Jesus, not the version of him that's been given to us. Not the version of him that people have felt the pressure to sugarcoat, refine, shave off the rough parts and give to us so that we can receive it without complaining. Because part of it is that because the congregation refused to receive it, then the pastors felt the pressure to find another version of Jesus that they could offer us. But Simon Peter is answering Jesus. He says, to whom shall we go? That is, this is it. Give away or no give away. Bread or no bread. Hard words or no hard words. This is it for me. This is it for us, period. To whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. We're going to take a prayer before we close, just for one minute. And that prayer is very important. We're going to ask God to really reveal himself to us, because let me tell you, other people's encounters and other people's narratives of Christ can take you only so far. But if you will stand and if you will respond the way Peter responded to him when he asked that most crucial question, it will have to be because you have encountered Christ himself. And I'm not talking about standing in front of the church and saying, Father, I give my life. No, I'm talking about encountering Christ to where you can say, I believe. See, these situations around me, I agree with you. It's not making sense, but I believe and I am sure that thou art Christ. And that's it. Whether or not you do this, whether or not you give me that, this is it for me. I have nowhere else to go. I love it. It says, whom shall we go? To whom shall we go? And this has to be it for you. Now I was talking about, you know, a situation earlier when she was praying. Some of us, the way our, our standing is, the way our footing is, it's where if somebody just comes and says, I can take you somewhere, our bags are already packed. We're ready to go. But this, you have to get to this point. Where no matter how many people are wanting to take you to this person and that person, your answer is, to whom shall I go? There's nowhere else for me but Christ. Because I know and I believe he is Christ, the son of the living God, and that's it for me. So let's just take a minute to pray because the word of God always comes to help us find our alignment in him. And I don't teach this today because I'm in a point of perfection. When I you know, get to the message next week because we're going to continue this in, from another angle next week. You know, then I'll share my personal stories, right? Because I already shared some. Look at me looking for a church because I was trying to find a young single Nigerian man, not knowing that God had orchestrated a whole relocation from Nigeria for me and that I had already met my husband. He just, was, he just wasn't in that church. He wasn't in that city. He wasn't even in that state, but I had met him. I just didn't know it. But I'm there in the church thinking, can I stay in this church? All the young men, they have, they've married them or they are dating someone, you know? And I'm thinking I need to go somewhere else. I was still coming to Christ because of stuff at that time. Meanwhile, Christ had taken care of the matter of husband or whatever else. So I want us to pray today because we are humans. And a lot of us will likely come to that point where our faith is tested. Our resolve is tested. So we're going to be asking God for grace. We're going to be asking God for that personal encounter so that we can respond the way Peter responded, no matter what situation we face, and say, thou art Christ. That's it for me. So let's just open our mouths and sincerely from our hearts, ask God for a personal encounter. And if you are thinking like, oh, I've been long in this game, I know Christ, ask God to renew your encounter. Yes, ask God to renew your encounter. Ask God to give you something new. Madam Kenny was 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 uh, uh, was teaching when she was leading her prayer point. She said he's going to do a new thing. Ask God to give you a new encounter of Him that reminds you of why you came, 
remind you of who he is and why you will stay till the very end. Let's just take a minute to say this prayer. Maso kaliba rante feneka. Come off mute if you can. Pray with me. Let's just ask God with one voice. Father, renew my encounter with Christ. I must know Christ himself. I must know Christ. I must know Christ. I must know Christ. I have heard good teachings. I have found good community in church. I have networked. I have found business partners. I have found a husband. But I want Christ. I need to know Christ. I need to know Christ. Father, give me an encounter. Give me a renewed encounter of the person of Christ. Father, we ask for a fresh visitation. We ask for a fresh encounter. Father, renew our encounter with you. Father, renew our right spirit within us. Renew our communion. Renew our sacred place. Oh, Father, let there be times of refreshing upon us right now and cause us to experience you anew. Let us experience you anew. Let it feel like the first day of that relationship that we started with you. For those still yet to have a personal encounter with a person of Jesus, Father, we ask that you reveal yourself to us, Lord God. We have seen you in the scriptures and now we want to see you, Lord. We want to see you, Father. Grant us a new encounter that we may be able to stand regardless of what's going on and say, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, to whom shall we go? We have nowhere else to go but you are each for us. I thank you ladies for your time. You know, I don't take your time for granted. I think it's a huge sacrifice to show up on a Saturday afternoon. So Thank you for your time. God bless you. I hope that you were blessed. I hope that, you know, some part of the word resonated with you. I hope it was something to just recharge you, refresh you. Because I find that in the walk with God, every now and then we must be reminded of these things that we already know. We must be reminded. That way it stays fresh in us. We stay on guard. We stay on alert. Okay. So God bless everyone. Um, and we will continue our conversations in the uh, on, on WhatsApp. God bless you. And we'll see you next week. God bless you. Bye, everyone.